So I want to tell you the timeline of how I became a doctor and a dentist because it might seem unachievable, but when you see the steps of how I got there, you'll realize how it's something that if you break it down and apply yourself, you could probably achieve too. To the point where when someone comes up to you and says, wow, a doctor and a dentist, you'll actually realize that it's not that big a deal because you realize the steps that you took to get there. Because it's like that saying of people often overestimate what they can achieve in a year, but underestimate what they can achieve in a decade. And when I look back over the last 10 years, I actually think, well, yeah, that's pretty cool. But this is the mentality that I like to teach my students students when I'm coaching them to get into medical school, that if you have patience and have that long-term mentality, laying one brick at a time consistently and being patient, that is when you achieve the big goals over a long period of time. So let's dive in with what I think are the key landmarks that got me to being both a doctor and a dentist in eight years time. So the first thing that I think is important that set the foundation for these achievements are that I started work when I was about 12, 13 years old. So the first thing I did was a paper round. So I don't know what people get today but back then I got something between 10 and 15 quid for a week's work where that was probably two hours every day and you know what it's like delivering papers. Then when I was 14 I got a job in a garden centre and I was so chuffed at this but really it was the most ridiculous thing because for eight hours a day from nine to five I was just filling those trays that you get for multi-packs of flowers with dirt but at the time I absolutely loved it because I mean I was 14 years old and Although it was probably slave labor, I just loved that I got 20 quid for a day's work and luckily I did it with my best friend. So we were just there chilling all day, filling these trays with dirt and just talking rubbish and just having a good time. But the reason those things were important and laid the foundation are because they give you respect for jobs and also kind of make you realize that you do want to earn more money with your time and do something that is more enjoyable for the time that you have to actually spend working. But that was a key part because what it did was encourage me when I was 16 to actually get a proper job in a hospital because for a 16 year old, the best pay that I could get was serving the food on the wards. And that is what actually led to me wanting to be a doctor. I had no ambitions to do it before that. And it was literally just being on the wards, helping people out, talking to patients that I realized that I enjoyed the environment and enjoyed helping people and maybe started considering that medicine was for me. Now, one of the most important lessons that I teach my students when I'm coaching them to get into medical school is proximity. Because I was based in the hospital, that naturally led to loads of good things happening. So I already had great experience from the job, but that also helped me organize my shadowing and all my volunteering and just really accumulated all these amazing things from my CV that helped me get into medical school when I came to apply. So off the back of those jobs, I obviously got into medical school and that was one of the best times. Firstly, I managed to get a year out, so I went traveling for a year before medical school started. And then medical school itself was just the best time ever. I literally loved every minute of it and I'm so glad that I did the experience. And then once I finished, I did my foundation training up in Yorkshire. Now for this, my first job was surgery and I absolutely loved it. I just loved the fast pace. I loved surgical procedures in the way that they more often than not take something do a procedure and then fix the problem and send them home cured. Now, of course, that's not always the case, but more often than not, that is the aim to provide a definitive solution to a problem. And at the time, I wasn't sure exactly what type of surgery I wanted to do, but I was pretty sure that I wanted to do plastic surgery. Now that brings me on to a really important lesson that I teach my students when I'm coaching them to get into medical school. Plastic surgery today is still the most competitive specialty in medicine. So my thinking was, I'm not certain that I want to be a plastic surgeon, but if I build my CV to get into plastic surgery, it's gonna to have to be of the highest standard of the medical CVs that are being built out there. So I can always have the option then if I decide that I don't want to go into plastic surgery and I want to go into something else. If my CV is at a level that's up here to get in the most competitive stuff, then if I go to something that's less competitive, I'll definitely have a good CV that's qualified enough to get into one of the other specialties. And that's the lesson that I teach to my students when I'm coaching them for medical school, that if you want to get into something that's here, you have to raise your standard to something that's here so that you can make sure that you're, you're definitely meeting the grade. And that is the same with how I coach interviews and how I coach BMAT and UCAT and personal statements and all the stuff needed to get in. So then we fast forward a couple of years to the end of foundation training. And this was probably the trickiest time that I had as a doctor. So I knew that I wanted to do surgery, but I wasn't sure exactly which specialty. I, I was still playing with plastics. I also liked ENT, but I hadn't actually gone through all the surgical specialties. 
Now, depending on how you split it, there are kind of between 10 and, and 14 surgical specialties. So I basically just took the time to systematically go through all of them. And actually around that time, I got offered my first choice job, which was in Manchester doing an ENT themed surgical placement. But I actually decided not to take it because I'd always had a calling for London and I always felt like that was the place that I at least wanted to go and live in for a year. So I decided to take the difficult choice of turning down that job, which was my first choice, and actually come to London where I started working here as a locum. And this was a particularly difficult time for me because although locuming is great for a lot of reasons, flexibility, better pay, as a locum, you don't really get the same stability and support to help you grow that you would if you were in a training post. So at that point, I really had to decide what I wanted to do. I was really struggling with that year of locum work and feeling like I was very directionless, which is a strange thing for doctors because we typically tend to have a very well-defined path and kind of just get on the conveyor belt to consultancy. So for me, it was a case of systematically going through all of those surgical specialties, getting some exposure in each and trying to deduce which specialty was actually the right one for me. And I always joke that it's a bit like when people talk about finding their one with their wife, because as soon as I got some exposure in MaxFact, I knew that that was the specialty that I wanted to pursue. But with maxillofacial surgery in the UK, you have to hold not only a doctor's degree, but also a dentist's degree. So then started the really fun search of having to find a dental degree that I could do that would quickly get me through it. And I was very lucky that King's College London offered a course that lets you do dentistry in just three years instead of five now it was super competitive there's something ridiculous like 130 maybe more positions to just 10 places available and i was very lucky that i got on that and really grateful for that post and it was a super intense first year where you basically catch up the first three years of dentistry in one year so that was really intense and then finish that dentistry degree in about three years. So that means that the five years of medicine plus the three years of dentistry got me those two degrees in just under eight years. And I can tell you that even though I was very lucky to get on that course and it helps you accelerate through dentistry in just three years, it did not come easy. Firstly, I had loads of resistance. My parents had no idea why I was doing what I was doing. All my friends and my fellow medical colleagues thought that I'd lost the plot. You don't really appreciate that for your first degree, your main occupation is being a student and more often than not, people just focus their entire energy on that and that is the thing that they do. When I was doing my second degree, that was not the case at all. I was you know, working as a doctor, the course was super intense, it was full time, 40 hours a week, but I also had things like you know, a mortgage and a life and a family and a girlfriend to see. So it's kind of like, I use compare it to having two full-time jobs because basically I would do the Monday to Friday, nine to five, 40 hours of uni. And then outside of that 40 hours, I would pretty much have to find another 40 hours of work to be able to afford the course and just to sustain my life in London. And there we go, lo and behold, I got through it and now I have both degrees in medicine and dentistry. Now, the big question that you're probably asking is which is better, dentistry or medicine? And that is something that I discuss in this very video with the pros and cons of each. So thank you for watching and just have a lovely, lovely day.